It's as if we've wandered the desert. Travelers without a home. Together yet alone in this uncertainty. An uncommon time, unexpected, undefined, binds us, unites us, does not divide us, but reminds us of who we are. A body, not a building, unrelenting, unyielding, persevering, revealing the faithfulness of God. Maybe this virus has started a fire inside us, ignited us, inspired us to live louder, love harder, care deeper. Six feet, six miles, or a world apart. Our calling remains the same. For we are the body of Christ. Good morning, and welcome to Supply Church Online. We're so happy you're here with us this morning. We pray that you have been outside enjoying the beautiful June weather, and we hope that you are staying safe and healthy during this difficult time. If you get a chance, hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, or leave us a comment. Let us know how we're doing and how we can serve you better. I have a couple announcements for us this morning. Today, Sunday, we will be offering two Zoom informational meetings to share with you the results of the survey and to answer any questions or concerns you may have as we prepare to worship together again in the sanctuary in the near future. We hope that you will be able to attend one of those scheduled times. Our first Zoom meeting today will be at 3 p.m. and our second Zoom meeting will be at 7 p.m. Please know if you do not have a computer or a way to get into Zoom, there is a phone number you can call that will allow you to participate in that meeting. Please reach out to myself this afternoon if you need any help with the Zoom link or with that phone number. We really hope to get as many of you as we can in those meetings. The Interfaith Food Cupboard is still in need, and thankfully several bags of groceries have already been dropped off at the church office. The deacons will again do a collection from your home Next Wednesday, July 1st, they will come to your home and pick up any donations from your front porch sometime after 11.30 a.m. If you still prefer to drop the, the items off at the church, the boxes are available outside the church office. Please contact Amy Willerman to arrange a pickup time for Wednesday, July 1st, if that is your preference. And Pastor Don will continue to do his prayer Zoom meetings on Mondays at 11 a.m. Please call the church office Monday morning if you need help with that login and join him at 11 a.m. in prayer. Friends, let us worship God today, for God is great. God has blessed us with life, with faith, and with community. Let us worship God today, for God is good. God forgives us, God encourages us, and God loves us. Let us worship today because we are God's people. Let us worship God. Please join me in prayer. Let us bow our heads. Lord God, we begin today by giving you thanks. We thank you for your never-ending love. We thank you for giving us your word so that we may follow your ways. As we worship today, we pray that we hear your voice. We ask that your Holy Spirit be at work in us opening our ears and our hearts to receive your word. Lord, we pray together now the prayer that your Son has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. The missionary for the month of July is Renee Padilla in Latin America. Renee works with the United World Mission 
and he spends much of his time writing, editing, and publishing, while the Kairos ministry allows him the opportunity to work with the poor in Buenos Aires. We're happy to have a video to show you this morning to provide updates in Renee's own words. Good morning, boys and girls. I'm guessing that every once in a while, mom and dad serve something for dinner that you're not too excited about. It might be a big plate of peas. Ooh, hard to get excited about that, right? But we do have something that can help us out on our table, typically. It's a salt shaker. So let's put a little salt on, and we'll see if that doesn't help our peas taste better. Mm-hmm. It definitely helps, but there's still something missing. Now, what do we usually find beside the salt shaker? A pepper shaker. Let's try that. So I'll pepper them up and we'll take another bite. Yep, much better. Salt and pepper complement each other. They're, they're foods that go together much like peanut butter and jelly. Now they don't taste the same, they don't look the same. If you put it out in your hand, the salt and pepper are totally the opposite color. But yet when we put them together, they just work. They just, they make things taste so much better. They're much like a true friendship. People can have all kinds of differences. We can look different. We can have different interests. Some people like sports, some people don't. Some people like to read, some people don't. But it doesn't matter if you have a real true friendship, if you really go together like salt and pepper, you're going to be there for each other to make the good times and the bad times better. So as you're going through your days, I hope you'll surround yourself with friendships and people who, who love you no matter what you like, no matter what you look like. I hope that you'll stick with people who are willing to be there for you always, just like salt is always with pepper.
This morning's scripture comes from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, verses 14 through 15, and verses 20 through 23. Clean and unclean. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were unclean, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are but rules taught by men. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. Verses 14 through 15. And again, Jesus called to the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Verse 20 to 23. He went on. What comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. Good morning. Nice to be together with you in worship. And hopefully we're getting closer to the time when we'll all be together in the sanctuary for worship. But in the meantime, let's see what God has to say to us through his word today. How he wants to speak to our lives and allow his Holy Spirit move us. So pray with me if you will. Loving and gracious God, pour down your blessing upon your people and allow your word to illuminate our lives so that we might be among those who follow you, that one day we might hear from you, well done, good and faithful servants. Amen. A young couple decided to visit a particular church one Sunday morning. They dressed as they always did. They got their jeans on and their t-shirts. In fact, the young man even had a beer advertisement on his shirt. And so as they made their way up to the church sidewalk, one of the church ushers uh, noticed they were coming and immediately jumped into action and got two more members of the church and went over to them and started to talk to them and started to be inquisitive of them. Now, these three men were friendly, but indeed they were very inquisitive. And so they asked them and they found out that the couple had never been in their church before, that in fact the couple rarely goes to church, and that this was really one of the first times that they had come to worship. Finally, the decision was made by the three power brokers, the three ushers, if you will, that they really shouldn't be allowed into worship. They were, if you will, pronounced unclean, and they were told that they could come back, but they had to change their clothes especially the t-shirt that had the beer advertisement. And so they were asked to go and change. Wow, after I read that scenario, I thought to myself, I wonder how many times I've been guilty of putting a barrier up between someone else and their Lord. And what do the scriptures have to say about our ability or our right to make judgments about others on the basis of externals? Here we see Jesus' viewpoint of what makes one unclean versus the Pharisees' viewpoint of what makes one unclean. And in this passage, it appears to us that Jesus is really getting down to brass tacks and he's getting down to that which is important, telling us what is pleasing to God and what is not. As was read for us 
a little while ago, we were told that one day Jesus was having lunch with his uh, disciples. And the Pharisees happened by, and they were astonished when they saw Jesus and his disciples eating together, especially knowing that they had not washed their hands before they sat down to do so. They were, according to the traditions of the elders, religiously unclean, and Jesus, it seemed, did not care or did not notice. But from the perspective of the Pharisees, people could become religiously unclean by not washing their hands before they ate or by encountering someone who was already unclean and being with them, or you could become religiously or ceremoniously unclean by eating off plates that were not clean. So in verse 15, Jesus utters these words, nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. Does that mean you should no longer tell your son or your daughter that they should wash their hands before dinner? It wasn't as though Jesus was opposed to hygiene, but rather, as he explained to his disciples, it is not food or external things that make one unclean or displeasing to God. It is rather the unclean words or the things that emerge from us, the actions that are negative that makes us displeasing to God. The point is, God looks at each one of us from the inside out, as the sermon title implies. We are not judged by whether we have a lack of hair. We are not judged by whether we do our work with a hammer or with a computer. We are not judged on the basis of whether we drive a Chevy or a Ford. Instead, we are evaluated by the living God by what we do in our lives based on the inward decisions that we make. Unless any of us would think in our minds that our outward appearance is better than someone else, Jesus encircles all of us in one way or another at the throne of God's grace. And he says, look at some of the things that you do to displease God. Sexual sins, deceit, theft, murder, adultery, malice, deceit, slander, arrogance. And you'll note that any of the things in the list that I just shared with you don't include things like diseases, unwashed hands, non-kosher foods, Gentiles, Romans, Samaritans, tax collectors, prostitutes, the poor, the rich, anybody who is not like us. So what are we going to do with Jesus' words to us? And so with a firm reminder, Jesus says that no outward set of rituals or self-prescribed religiosity can make an adequate substitute for a genuine relationship in Jesus Christ that depends on grace rather than ceremony, on the love of the Lord rather than the love of the law. You see, what got the Pharisees into trouble was when they allowed a legitimate religious symbol to get in the way and set the stage for spiritual play acting. There are passages in the Old Testament, in Exodus and in Numbers, where it speaks about the fact that God's people are to wash their hands before they go into the temple. The problem with the Pharisees was that they took it too far. They took it to the point where they thought that the very act of washing their hands, the very act of doing that made them holy. Listen, holiness comes not from that. Holiness comes from the Lord. Holiness is imparted to us through God's grace, not some outward manifestation of our own effort. And therefore, how do we apply the wisdom that is in the passage that we have for today. But I just want to share with you three little reminders, three things that may be helpful for us to remember. And the first is that ritual cannot be used to justify sin. That is, we who are the church sometimes get to thinking that we are better than others because of our external work that we do or because of the appearance that we give or at least think that we do the right things most of the time. And many a times that is true about the life of the church, this church and other churches, that more often than not that we do good things and we do good ministry. But there's a whole lot of difference between what we think is good and what we think really counts versus what God does. And so we need to be sure that we're doing acts of ministry on the basis of the right motivation. That was one of the things that Jesus was trying to get into the heart and minds of the Pharisees. 
Were they doing things for the right reason, for the right motivation? Listen, Pastor, I wanted to tell you, I am currently in three Bible studies. I teach Sunday school. I sing in uh, the choir and I pray regularly and read the scripture regularly. What do you mean by saying to me that I really need to take care of the broken relationship that I have had with my neighbor for the last two years? It's not my fault. He doesn't engage in half the religious activities that I do. Pure hands, possibly, but a polluted heart. And our quest for self-justification can be so subtle that sometimes we may not even realize what's going on, that our religious ritual to, that creates a false sense of piety gets us running into a, a sort of quicksand situation. I remember what took place in, in my life a while ago. I was driving home one day and thinking to myself, Lord, you must be happy with me because I made a lot of visits today. And then all of a sudden, the thought flooded my mind. And what was valuable about what I had then was not the number of visits that I made or even that I had made them. What was important were the lessons and the connections that were made between myself and the people that I was with. Rituals and activities that are not heartfelt, that did not come from the right motivation, fall short of the glory of God. That is, when we don't have the right motivation for the ministry that we're doing, it falls short of God's purpose for us in that moment. And secondly, Jesus reminded us that we cannot blame our being unclean on somebody else or some external thing. We don't always like to hear this, but the fact of the matter is that we are considered sinners before God. We are unclean before God. Rather, we have just sanitized our hands five minutes before or not. We are unclean before God because of the sin in our lives. And that sin has its root within, not externally. Someone once said to me, well, Reverend, how do you know if I sin? You don't see me. You don't witness my behavior. So how do you know that I sin? To which I responded, whoever taught you had a lie. No one said, I guess I learned that on my own. The propensity to ignore the will of God is something that exists in each one of us. Blaming it on something else or someone else doesn't take it away. Regardless of how many times we wash our hands today or whether we jumped in the shower twice or we even jumped in the swimming pool, none of that magically takes away the hurt that we may have caused someone else and the Lord. That is what Jesus was trying desperately to communicate to the Pharisees. The heart has been made the center for defilement. No outward ritual can cleanse it. And as Jesus cites just a few of the things that we do to displease God, it makes us aware of the fact that we are unworthy before his throne of grace. And even though we are unworthy because of our iniquity, God in Jesus Christ is already positioning himself at the cross to die in our behalf so that we might be forgiven. You know, the sad part of this passage is that the Pharisees kept washing their hands and wanted everybody else to do so when the soap, when the miracle was right in front of them in the person of Jesus. It is through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. It is by Christ alone that we are forgiven before the Lord. The motivation to do the right thing and create healthy rituals or healthy ways of living out our role as a disciple is indeed doing things like going to worship and reading the scriptures and praying and working through relationships with others. But that doesn't come from any power that we possess inside. The strength to do that comes from the power we receive from Christ. Our redemptive works come from the inside out. When we allow God to cleanse our heart through putting Christ on the center of our lives, then there is a transformation, not only on the inside, but on the outside too. God, Paul tells us, was reconciling the world unto himself, not counting their sins against them. And so here's the thing for us to think about when we reflect on this passage today. Do we believe that we are forgiven? And do we show that to others by the way we live? Do we believe that we are forgiven and do we show that to others by the way that we live? That's what the Pharisees 
we're missing out on. And God doesn't want us to miss out on his grace whatsoever. Can we pray together? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for the fact that it touches our lives and that it is so current and so applicable to what we do each and every day. And we pray that we might take the wisdom of your word and apply it to our encounters that are going to come about in the week ahead. And help us to remember the attitude that we are to have, the attitude that we have even when we pray to you, our Lord. For we are told in Scripture that when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who want to stand on the corner and be seen by men. Instead, Jesus says, when you pray, go into your closet and pray to your Heavenly Father. And your Heavenly Father who sees you in secret will one day reward you. And so we ask, O Lord, that you'll put your blessing upon your people and that we will act from the right motivations and that you might be pleased with how we have responded to your word this day. Amen. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect to do that which is pleasing in his name, both now and even forevermore. Amen. Amen.